So dear students, dear guests, dear professors, we open the series of conferences of the Forum of Hi on History and Philosophy of Religions in this academic year with the lecture given by Father Stephen Hadley. I mentioned that Forum on the History and Philosophy of Religions is a platform for academic debates within the Faculty of Theology of Vilnius University of Constanza. Um, Stephen Hadley is a social anthropologist and a priest of the Orthodox Church. He is best known for his books on the anthropology of prayer and the ethnography of central Java in Indonesia. Father Stephen earned the bachelor degree in Oriental Studies from Columbia University, where he studied under a Romanian professor Anton Sigmund Cerbo. He obtained the master's degree in body studies from the same university in 1969 and continued his studies in uh, Paris uh, with a diploma in Sanskrit philology at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes. His doctorate is in social anthropology under the coordination of Professor George Condominas at the Sorbonne in 1979. He also studied theology at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminar in the United States and at the St. Sergius Institute of Orthodox Theology in Paris. He worked at the French National Center for Scientific Research from 18. 1981 to 2008, and also he taught in Moscow and undertook field work on parish life. Between 1973 and 2005, Father Stephen did extensive field work in central Java, a province, a province of Indonesia. The title of his presentation is After Secularization, Two Sketches. Hans, Joas, and Jean-Luc Marion. Father Stephen, we are very honored, honored to have you today with us. The floor is yours. And please open your mic. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure. And I hope we are able to stay in touch in the months that come. Um, I apologize, this will be very quickly done, only half an hour, because I'm very interested by your questions, and I, you probably know much more about certain aspects of these issues than I do. Secularization in France and Germany is a gigantic topic. There is a jungle of well-written, well-argued books in philosophy or religion, which have been published for the last 150 years. I'm just going to dig in briefly to two books. One is um, by a German. I have the French edition because I do not read German. Um, this is the book, Hans Joas, Les Pouvoirs du Sacré, The Powers of the Sacred, An Alternative Narration of Disenchantment. But what really interests me is an, another book also published this year, uh, Jean-Luc Marion, who is probably the greatest living Catholic theologian in France, called um, impossible title to, trans to translate, D'ailleurs la Révélation, Revelation from Elsewhere. Um, so let me go telegraphically, I apologize very quickly, through some of the main features of uh, Hans Joas's book, which I must say is excellent, although it doesn't answer the questions I'm asking. This book reviews the appreciation of the sacred as analyzed by religious philosophers, especially in Germany during the 20th century. The persistence of the sacred is taken seriously by Hans Joas, but not because of any belief in any supposed return of religion, as in the writings of Peter Berger. Our author, author also presents a different understanding of the so-called inevitable disappearance of Christianity um, than that presented by Marcel Gaucher, who is very influential, uh, by analyzing the tensions that exist between religion and politics. Joas refutes the dictatorship of secularization and implicitly the notion of a European citadel against Islam. After a careful critique of Max Weber's text, Intermediary Considerations in chapter six, Joas shows that while Weber was fascinated by religion, tragically, he could not himself be a believer 
for he thought that the destiny of modern man was religious indifference. For Weber, the appearance of capitalism as the dominant ideology had a personal impact. He refuses to admit a Christian theodicy where God himself consents to human suffering, where man renounces his life to allow Christ to save him, experiencing an understanding of true transcendence. Instead, following Weber, Panjoas analyzes um, Jasper. Jasper's uh, axial period, which is downstream from Weber, of course, um, put forward a very different and more positive understanding of faith. The atheism of Feuerbach, Schopenhauer, Marx, and Nietzsche was are treated by Joas as passing philosophical fashions. While for Weber, this had been partially due to the disappearance of Christian theodicy, thus requiring a general, general European ideological reconstruction. Transcendence is nonetheless present in Trollich, whom Weber read attentive, attentively. For Trollich admitted the category of religion was an a priori, while for someone like Leo Strauss, it was reduced to an idealist, idealistic and romantic truth. The divine is humanized, the human is divinized, and thus no, one can deny the historicity of revelation altogether. Now, this is related, says Joas, partially to the depression caused by the First World War and the decline of traditional values in Germany, which was confronted by Harnack, Trollich, Cohen, and Buber. They considered it the death of our youth in the hope, the death of hope that in the middle of man's life should sustain him. Another horizon of hope had to be created. Now this relates to Carl Jasper's The Origin and Meaning of History published in 1949. It was necessary to reframe, to reinterpret this discouragement in terms of a broad history of religion. Jasper was also reacting to the horrors of German national socialism. He famously described from the very beginning uh, the period circa 500 BC when divine royalty, ancestor worship and overriding mythologies were, began to be demoted by a broader universalism, that of the new universal faith, which, in, faiths, which included even Greek philosophy. This desacralization of political domination had as a result the differentiation of ethnic collectives as well as religious ones. Prophets and priests decipher the will of God and the order of the world below is modified, creating a new social dynamic. For Jaspers, a plurality of existing universalisms should be admitted, whereas for Weber, the choice of ultimate values um, as in the religious philosophers. For example, Father Alexander Schmemann has a book of the same title. Um, before him was the way forward for religious philosophy on the basis of a careful discussion of the existing articulations of religion in the public sphere. He remarks that when religion replaces mythology during the axial age, this opens the door for a search for symbolicity of symbols. And this is only a question, for this might explain something about what Mircea Eliade was about. The discovery of the religious phenomenon in a secular age is characterized as an invention. Already in the first half of the 19th century, Ernst van Lasso argued for a comprehension of religion as a phenomenon that was inclusive. Although Lasso left no place for a recapitulation through the resurrection and return of Christ at the end of time. Weber again. Weber had opted for a reconstruction of Western rationalism. His last unfinished work was entitled, There Is No Orient. In 1938, he argued <clears throat> that the earliest political religion was that of a Kenaton. This fits with Jaspers and was much better done by uh, Jan Asman in 2008. A, a Kenanon, pharaoh in Egypt, circa 1353-1336 BC, was the 10th ruler of the 18th dynasty. When Vogelin argued for a political role for Christianity, we have <clears throat> the transposition of eschatology into imminence, which was plagued by the difficulty of differentiating ultimate reality from the representation of the human condition. However, the advantage of Vogelin's approach was to concentrate on experience and not ideology. A century later, Paul Ricoeur, a student of Jasper's, 
will treat religion as understandable not by any conceptual framework, but by phenomenology, reflecting the critiques of Husserl and Heidegger. Across the Atlantic, and this is surprising, as early as 1902, William James considered symbols as preconceptual historical experiences. In the 20th century, all these currents of thoughts immediately become extremely interwoven, a jungle of concepts. Eisenstadt synthesizes Weber and Martin Buber. Robert Bella synthesizes Talcott Parkin and Paul Tillich. The tensions between Christian doctrine and institutions was achieved by a compromise uh, that qualified the social order as that axiality. Jaspers, in his effort to surpass the Eurocentric and Christocentric understanding of universal religious history, was motivated by his belief that without history, without the history of social changes in the state in statehood, there is no way to understand religious history. Eisenstadt overcomes Weber's myopia of Orientalism, despite his great erudition, by invoking multiple modernities. In this essentialism, there are three levels, ideals, their institutionalization, and their empirical realization, which reflects Weber's typology. The elimination of magic, which deposed of the sacred, meant that transcendence is radicalized and becomes an ethnic. This should bring us to the domain of theology, which is our real concern. So in less than three pages, I just wanted in to uh, evoke by name only the major themes that are at stake here. And it's very difficult for um, a Catholic, a Protestant, or an Orthodox in France to be faced by all this. It's, it's, it's an enormous uh, ideological firewall, if you like. Now, uh, let me consider one case of, um, concerning France. At the beginning of the 20th century in France, first of all, there was the movement of the militants for the separation of church and state, which resulted in the passage of the famous law of 1905. Then a hundred years later, a very diff different yet compatible postmodern fashion grew out of the critique of modernity, disillusion with the promises of modernity and violent rejection of most of its premises and certitudes. While they did not put into question secularization, this involved a greater and permanent questioning, a general denial of knowledge. Everything merits revelization. No answers are welcome. Postmodernism is not secularization, but consolidates it in France by casting doubts on any claims for revelation or of taking religious seri religion seriously. Marcel Gaucher, the author of a very famous book, The Disenchantment of the World, 1985, set the tone. The editor of the prestigious Parisian Review, Débat, for 50 years, and Gaucher has recently claimed that civil society would not be laïc, would not be lay, a lay society, if its society and churches were not ruled by dolls, laws dictated by the state. Individual private conscience alone remains free, but for what? He claims um, that the ensuing blend of fear of immigration without assimilation and Islamic terrorism has become inevitable. Can anyone can become a Frenchman, but only by assimilating what they now call Republican values. What defines this new militancy in France is intolerance, denunciation, exclusion, inane de de um, decolonialization studies, white hatred, and hatred of the West, says Gaucher. In this playing field of acrimonious debates by very brilliant and careful thinkers, fortunately, there are theologians. I've chosen one. Jean-Luc Marion just published a book, which I showed at the beginning, Ailleurs la Révélation, a revelation from elsewhere. And I will summarize very quickly below chapters 11 and 12 from this carefully argued, argued explanation of what Christians receive in Revelation. If you're interested to know more about uh, Marion, you just go on the, the web. He's published at least 20 books and he's a very, very careful um, theologian and philosopher with a good knowledge of Hebrew and Greek. And um, I, I must say, I'm in, in admiration of the way he works. Marion's first point is that unlike Homer and Ovid, our God manifests himself initially not as a person in the sense of Greek mythology. Even Homer said that the gods do not manifest 
themselves to us clearly, Odyssey chapter 16. All we remember, in, <coughs> we all remember in Exodus 33, verse 20, God said, you, can, you cannot see my face, for man cannot see me and live. The mystery from the Greek word, verb, muo, to keep silent, is the privilege of his immortality and his invisibility. The evidence of the Greek gods is fleeting. Athena comes and goes in an instant. Their proximity is cherished in their polytheism as their familiarity and strangeness, but they never show themselves as they are, if indeed they have an are. They're never seen in person, face to face with men. So by their fleeting appearance, they risk nothing. Their masks allow them to appear in order not to have to appear. They're gods without any true face. Heraclitus said that the oracle of Delphi, they only made signs in guise of a name. All they can give is death because they have no flesh. Their name is a substitute for flesh. In this sense, they're idols without being persons. Anonymous theophanies, which are invisible because they have no bodies or faces. In this sense, to address, address the Greek idol is not to see a face, but only the reflection of oneself. It is the invisible mirror of what one seeks to see, what Marcel Detienne calls <clears throat> totiagoric uh, monuments, tautologies but one that provokes an adoration of oneself, for before it, all that remains is oneself looking. As Ovid says in the Metamorphoses, it is I who produces it and I who destroys it. Now let's see what uh, Marion has to say. In Revelation, how does the invisible appear? That's his question. As is well known in the Old Testament, there's a unique taboo against images, against presenting the divine as an image. When God decides to reveal, it is without visibility, Exodus 20, 19. If God were to speak to us, we would die. And then there was Moses, to whom God announced his manifestation on Sinai. The luminous glory of God is precisely this invisibility. He says to Moses, chapter 19, God, go down and meet the people so they will not come to see the Lord. And to Moses again in chapter 19, look, here it is me that comes to you in a dark cloud so that people will listen to you in the dark cloud and will have confidence in you. It is not being able to see in the cloud that permits God to speak to Moses. What Moses can give the people to see are only words. One sees them by hearing them. The Decalogue is then given, Exodus 20. A face-to-face has taken form the form of an exchange of words. The second alliance occurs after the episode of the golden calf, Exodus 33. Moses speaks to God face to face, but when he asks to see God's glory, he is told that it would kill him, and he only sees his back as he is hidden in the cleft of the cliff. Isaiah 6 verse 5 later also realizes, for having seen the Lord of the heavenly host, he is condemned. In order to lead his people, Moses needs to be accompanied by God. This is granted not through the sight of his face, but by his presence, his person. Presence in Hebrew is one of the names of God. God comes out of his elsewhere. It is his face, but not a mundane visage. His face is a word which he speaks and gives and keeps. The given word is an invisibility. Thus, um, Emmanuel Levinas says that a visage is revealed to another only when he remains invisible and speaks. Who is the God Moses seeks to face? God already knows Moses' name before they meet. God's glory then covers Moses as with a veil or charm, a devouring flame, chapter 25 of Exodus which is identified as the skin of a flaming face, chapter 34. Moses becomes God's friend and remains 40 days on the mountain with him. Already in Exodus 3, Moses is given to see an angel and henceforth to see his presence. When he approaches God, he is told to take off his sandals for he is on holy ground. 
All Moses can then do is to cry out in an appeal for a, heal, a hearing vision, Exodus 3, which is given to him. I am, I the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What is given by God is not his name, but his genealogy. In preceding alliances, Genesis 17, I am when I will be, quote unquote, realizes earlier alliances, which will be the future of his people. Again, again, a quote, Exodus 3, I am sent me for you. God speaks to promise salvation to for his people. This was prophesied in Deuteronomy 18. I will raise up among their brothers a prophet like you, for Moses has seen the invisible and heard the invisible. The name, Numbers 12, declines the form of Yahweh by the fact that Yahweh spoke to him. No one else knew God, and the Pentateuch concludes that Moses is the greatest of all the prophets, for no other knew him. Having heard God's name on the mountain of sight, Moriah is one of the names of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem later on, a revelation culminates in the hearing of God's name in the answer to Moses' cry. This is a phenomenon of, the, of a word, like an appeal that results in Abraham's hearing in Ur of Chaldea. That is God's calling him into exile. Once in exile, Abraham is visited. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, unto thy seed, I will give this land. And there he built a he an altar unto the Lord, which had appeared to him, Genesis 12. In Genesis 18, Abraham is visited at the Oak of Mambre, where he sees only three men, but where Sarah is promised Isaac. Abraham calls him El Shaddai, Genesis 17. Abraham is called, chapter 22, and having presented himself, as St. Paul says in Romans 4, he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. The final time Abraham is called, confirmed by his posterity, which blesses all the, creation, all the nations of the earth, for you have listened to my call. Chapter 22. This is the revelation, that of the election of the people of God and all humanity in Israel. All this would be definitively revealed in transcendence, that of the name of the invisible one, which only says that he is Yahweh, your God, Exodus 20. That I actually hides the unknown. When God says I, and he alone can do this, it is because he says it in giving his person in being present, that I is the root word of revelation. God names himself a subject, grammatically speaking. This I is a proper noun, according to Rosenzweig. The transcendence of God is ultimately revealed in the mystery of Jesus Christ, says St. Paul. Christ says that he is and that he is with us, Matthew 14. Jesus also said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, John 18, and as soon as he said, that as soon as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. I am ego imi, remains the name of the Lord. The transcendence of Christ allows him to accomplish the law. So in Luke 4, today, the word of scripture is accomplished in your ears. Christ does not reveal a new scripture as much as he accomplishes the old scripture. When he brings, what he brings this, what he brings that is new is himself. I am is a radical extreme presence as the three disciples saw on Mount Tabor, where in the dark cloud, as on Sinai, a voice is heard. This is my beloved son and listen to, listen to him. Such, such words can only be heard to the extent that one accepts to hear them. Here for mankind, sight is replaced by oral attention, concentration. No one has ever seen God. But the one and only son who is himself God and in the closest relationship with the father has made him known, John 1. Daniel hears the king say to him, chapter 2 of that prophecy, of a truth it is that your God is the God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. The mystery is disclosed by the unconceivable re re revealing himself 
at the same time as he remains inaccessible. His name remains unpronounceable unless he gives himself to be known, Luke 8. What is this presence? This presence, Shekinah, dwelling or settling, is one of the names of God. Such a discovery, Apocalypsis, encompasses and precedes all other forms of knowledge. The mystery cannot be said, although one can refuse to recognize it. Only God can decide to reveal himself for his secret mystery is hidden in him. He can also only reveal himself to be one to one who is willing to receive him. The finite inability to receive God must not be taken as stronger as stronger than God's ability to reveal himself. This gives us a key to the understanding of the general refusal of the world, the word transcendence or revelation for the secularized who refuse the approach of his mystery. Transcendence is an event, a phenomenon either possible or impossible, in, but in no case thinkable. For he remains known as the unknown. Conceptual grasping is of no avail here. It is indeed difficult to discover what remains both visible and silent. Our obedience consists in believing which gives citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, unless we are blinded by the glory of this world. A disclosed mystery in the secular world leaves us stupid, in quotes. Revelation can only be phenomenalized by recognizing it for what it is. How can what is, be given, what is given be discovered? For those who love God, the Holy Spirit reveals him, the spirit who scrutinizes all things, even the depths of God, 1 Corinthians 2, citing Isaiah 64. Christ gives his disciples the knowledge of the mystery of his reign, for they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, John 1. In this sense, only God the Father uncovers and discovers, as St. Paul in Galatians 4 says. <clears throat> and because you are my sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Albeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather known of God, you are his sons. In order to experience transcendence, revelation, in order for this mystery to be discovered for our spirit, for our noose, must see the mystery only as much as God has let it be seen. Here our intentionality is inverted, through such an anamorphosis. Any pretension to keeping a neutral position, that of a transcendent spectator, who would make the mystery the object of his intellection, is useless. So unless the phenomenalization, this revelation comes from God, that is to say, through the conversation of the I who is searching, it cannot occur. All this depends on the will of God, the spirit of God judges all things. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I hope the students can hear us and can hear me. Thank you very much for this presentation, this philosophical and also theological um, presentation regarding um, the reality um, of what we call after secularization in thought of um, Hans Joas and Jean-Luc Marion. I open the floor now uh, for questions. Please be my guest. For my students, if you, if you want to address a question, you can address in Romanian and I will translate it. Thank you. Okay, I will open <laughs> the floor regarding the questions. In that case, um, you know, according uh, to the book, of Steve Bruce, God is Dead, Secularization in the West. Um, according to him, secularization has three characteristics. First one, the importance of religious institutions, namely the church in society is declining. 
Uh, the second one, the social position of religion is declining. And third one, people are less religious. And he becomes the one of the exponents of the disappearance of religion from, from society. And we know that the traditional structure of religion, of religion have been strongly disputed by secularization. But at the beginning of 2000s, um, Peter Berger introduced a new concept according to the social realities, namely the secularization uh, to deny a variety of manifestation of the rebirth of a religion worldwide. He described the, this concept of desecularization as a counter secularization in modernity and also in postmodernity. This rebirth of religion keeps his traditional forms or it takes a new form of spiritualities, of secular spiritualities or syncretistic religious movement. What do you think about this transformation, about this metamorphosis regarding the religion? Uh, I know, of course, Berger's work. Um, I admire his work. But in each country, things are very different. Um, in France, if you... Um, interact with the Parisian intellectuals, um, you'll be constantly the subject of an attack. What, you, what in the world possesses you to believe in God? Uh, sometimes it's just that blunt. But that's not the real problem. We can endure personal attacks. Um, in social sciences, the social construction of reality is an undisputed axiom. And if uh, a Christian wants to uh, receive uh, the vocation of coming closer to God, he has to stand outside of that, which marginalizes him, which is why religions and not only Christianity are marginalized in, um, in a country like France. So um, I think the return of the religious um, has been widely analyzed and criticized by Marcel Gaucher and other people. Um, if it only takes place on the individual level of people's relationships with their Lord, with on the level of conversion, uh, one can't treat it as a major social phenomenon, but you can treat it as a very authentic phenomenon. Um, one would have said uh, prior to the death of Salon that there was no way for the Orthodox Church to return to uh, life in the Soviet Union. In Moscow today, there are a thousand churches. <clears throat> I studied three of them between 2006 and 2010 to see how they were reopening. And um, without being melodramatic, um, the, my Russian friend said, Father Stephen, you don't know much about Russia. That's not your fault. But let us tell you one basic thing. The blood of our martyrs is the only thing that has allowed us to do the work we are now doing. So. The renaissance of faith in a very different context depends on uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, the blood of the martyrs, the appalling memories that these martyrs' uh, deaths left, which was also full of hope, not just discouragement. Um, which is why a country like America is not as secularized perhaps as France, but when you go there, you think, well, you know, in Europe, they went through so many difficult times. What Christianity they have is deep Christianity. Um, and um, I'm not trying to put down the Pentecostal sects nor the evangelicals. Um, they're very admirable. Um, but asceticism um, for them doesn't mean very much. They live in what well, until recently was a prosperous economy. Um, I think in, in Europe, to come back to the social construction of reality, that's the main firewall against the return of the church. People do not believe that that's the way things happen, which is for me the reason that this 500 page book of Jean-Luc Marion, which says revelation has to be treated as what it is beyond all your concepts, ungraspable. Revelation reveals that God is unhearable, invisible, and start there and you can go forward. And I find that a very, very good starting point. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your answer. Um, from what I know, you have a lot of experience in, uh, in the Asia part of the world. Um, and um, there are 
differences between uh, interpretation of secularization or secularism in Europe or in India or Indonesia. Can you emphasize these, please, these differences between, uh, between Europe and, uh, and Asia, India or Indonesia? I'll try to. Um, why, why go off to Java when you're a parish priest in Paris? It seems like an unlikely move. Um, it was very interesting. Um, recently, there was a very good book um, published about Indonesia entitled Tolerance Without Secularization. And they, they weren't directly aiming at the French, but it certainly when, when you say that to the average French person, especially today, there's a major debate going on. Um, Secularization, absolutely necessary for tolerance. Well, that's not true. And that's interesting because uh, Indonesia, 260 million people is the largest Muslim country in the world. Now, if you follow the daily events, I was reading about on Al Jazeera about Indonesia this morning. Um, of course, occasionally um, flaring up violence and uh, murders. And all that. But that's true in any country, in any condition. No, I think that um, Java, Indonesia, but also India. India is an interesting example. It's in a different moment. Um, it was proclaimed a secular uh, country when it gained independence from Great, Great Britain um, and has um, promoted uh, secularism in a very low key form until recently. Um, now Modi's government, of course, has decided to capitalize on ethnic hatreds uh, against the large Muslim population of India. Um, so their secularization has not promoted the tolerance they were seeking to obtain. And there's some very good books by Indian sociologists of religion describing this in great detail. Um, where are we headed? Uh, Gandhi was trying to uh, allow the, all the temples to be open to all the outcasts, all the lower caste people. Um, that's recently been shut down. Um, one cannot judge the, the role of uh, church and faith relationships on the basis of one period, especially one as volatile as that un under Modi today. But um, the importance of daily practice of faith in India, if you've ever been to India, you agree with me, is absolutely gigantic. Absolutely gigantic. People go to temples three or four times a day, making all kinds of offerings and prayers and whatnot. And um, they do long pilgrimages on the on foot through that hot climate, 400 kilometers to go and pray on a sacred hill. Um, I find that very ambitious. And the same thing exists in Russia. We have these long pilgrimages in midsummer to when people pray all the way from one place to, to another place. Um, yeah, as a social anthropologist, what interests me is not the ideology, which I think doesn't have much to, to back it up, but the actual social practice. And even in India today, um, the faith does increase, uh, increase tolerance and the separation of church and state cannot fulfill its promises, which is part of the reason there's so much anger in Western Europe today over the Muslim uh, violence. Yeah, thank you. Um, Professor Alexandru, Ivan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the beautiful presentation you made. Uh, I have a lot of comments and questions. I don't want to, to steal the time from the students, but I will uh, resume myself to three uh, aspects. Uh, first of all, a follow-up from uh, Ivan's interesting question about differences between different secularization processes or secular uh, situations of the church. And I was asking myself whether uh, we could find any specificity in an orthodox secularization compared to the Western one, because all the theories, the, the concepts, even the term itself, seculum, were coined in, 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 in the West, in, in Western theology, uh, related to Western situation. Uh, can we apply those theories of Berger, of uh, Joas, of uh, Marion to the Orthodox milieu, or are they specifically uh, 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 built for the Western world? That would be my first question. 
whether there is a, an orthodox secularization, version of secularization. Uh, second, uh, uh, when I myself read a lot about secularization in a project I made, uh, I was trying to build up a map of the concept. And I saw there is a, a, a theological use of the world, secularization. Uh, radically speaking, God himself secularized, uh, secularizes himself in becoming man in the, in the person of Christ. A metaphorical, so to speak, secularization, theological secularization. There is a sociological one. There is a philosophical one in Hans Blumenberg, a very strong theory of secularization in Hans Blumenberg. Uh, I was asking, uh, which way do you prefer to see secularization as an event in the dialectic of revelation that expresses in the history, or is it, let's say, an accident of modernity, a, 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 a historical event linked to a specific phase in the history of mankind that is modernity and that will end as soon as modernity itself will end and will, uh, let's say, uh, finish its, its effects. So mm -hmm. is it secularization a theo merely theological event in the, in the dialectics of revelation or a historical event? Uh, and third, and that is uh, the last one, I promise, um, beginning with Marion, uh, so uh, in my view, after, after hearing you, he, uh, let's say, uh, speaks of, a, or speaks from the point of view of, a, let's say, maximal revelation, um, a revelation at, at its best, so to speak. Uh, and there are a lot of, uh, of uh, fences or uh, uh, obstacles between us and this revelation as a saturated phenomenon and so on, uh, as a, a, the presence of God himself. Uh, I wonder myself, uh, this is a personal question. So uh, when, when reading, for example, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, for now, we see through a glass, darkly. Is this darkly, or this glass, um, an effect of secularization? Do we not see now, in this world, fully, because of a historical uh, uh, situation of man, or because of an ontological, uh, uh, um, let's say, situation in which we are not able to see otherwise but through a dark, uh, through a glass darkly in this life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me take up your last point. Uh, my answer may not satisfy you because I'm always stepping off from my personal desire to deepen my faith. And for me, um, Marion is providing a very good understanding of transcendence as apophatic. And that's what we need. I don't want to read another book. I have read so many books about the ideological construction of secularization. These are often very well done and well argued, but it doesn't allow you to preserve the faith. Now, the map of these concepts is terribly complex. Hans Blumenberg did a good job. Um, but to me, all these arguments about uh, the recuperation of theological uh, Christian theological concepts in statehood, in sovereignty, are beside the point. In tribal societies, there are as many secularized people, almost, as in modern European societies. It's, it's, it's the part of the, the condition of man that um, it's difficult to face up to life's tragedies without a deep experience of God's grace and mercy. Now that's not gonna satisfy you, you as an answer, but that's where I wanna go. I, 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 want, I want to go in that direction. And for the first question of orthodox secularization, uh, you're in a posi better position to talk about that than myself. I found uh, in Russia, in spite of Putin and all the corruption and all the, we all know about that. Um, in a post-communist society, it was a deep thirst for Christian solidarity that took the form of social movements, work in hospitals, work with 
homeless children, uh, the construction of new churches, um, the life you know, of monasteries. Um, and all these orthodox religious phenomena are, of course, somewhat biased by the society in which they live. When you go to the female monastery of St. Seraphim of Sarofa de Vievo, there are 400 nuns there at, at, at the refectory. Now, that's a bit too much. <laughs> um, but it has to do with the period in which the monastery was finally reopened. And that was um, one of the things that one did. Um, so yes, there must be, especially in post-communist societies, a very specific form of orthodox secularization. In France, um, the Eraskede, the Russian student Christian movement in the 1930s tried to face up to the catastrophe of the Bolshevik revolution. Um, by the time the Second World War was over, we had very good theologians. Olivier Clément is a good example of that. He was trying to get on to better terms with secularized France. And um, he was a good theologian and a nice man. Um, I knew him well. Um, this leads, at least in the context of French society, Parisian intellectuals, to a certain number of compromises which don't work very well. Now, Athenite spirituality, you cannot translate, transplant into central Paris, but we have to preserve something of the deep uh, ascetical experience um, of our monasteries. When I came back from Egypt in February, I'd been to Wadi Al Rayyan and to the monastery of St. Macarius. I, was, I read a book called The Silent Patriarch by Thanios, which describes the life of Cyril VI, the patriarch, the then patriarch of, of the Coptic church in Russia. And the man turned around the situation which was in dire straits. The church was falling apart by what? By silence. You wouldn't go on the public square and talk this talk. And, you know, uh, he just stayed in the church and prayed and people came to him and said, help us, help us get out of here. Uh, it was, it's a very good book, by the way, if you want to read it. Um, so uh, I'm a, I apologize, this is not the answers you're looking for, but um, I cannot, as I work as a social anthropologist, stop being an Orthodox. I, I keep looking. And when I go to the Orthodox churches, which I saw created in Java, I'm very impressed. These people are courageous. These people are working in a very difficult situation. And it's always the difficulties that brings out the best in them. Thank you very much. If there are any other questions. I have another one. Uh, in the past, in the experience of the church in the past, uh, a challenge to the Christian faith uh, was the form of open atheism. Uh, do you think that in now in our contemporary society nowadays, um, this form is changing in regarding that the atheism seems to be, be to become or to be turning uh, into secularism? From what I know, secularism as a political philosophy um, must keep a kind of neutral attitude regarding the church. And um, secularism as also as a, po a political philosophy emphasized the separation between um, political um, sphere and the church. Do you think that there is a risk that um, secularism of our days uh, can become uh, a kind of atheistic attitude against the church, against the Christian faith, or what is your opinion? In France, nothing could be more politicized than secularization. <laughs> um, in Le Monde, I read this morning um, an article by Thomas Piketty, a very well-known economist, in which he pulls apart the so-called neutrality of French um, secularization. Secular laicite, I'm not gonna get into the problem of translating laicite. Um, and at the same time, um, and this has been well known for decades, um, the indifference, the nonchalance of secularism has been terribly damaging to the church because this is the atmosphere in which the children grow up in their lycées and in their universities. And uh, um, it's not the militant atheism of uh, Bolshevik Russia, 
when when you see believing Christians murdered by Bolsheviks, for many people that's a, a step forward to belief. Um, but when you're surrounded by indifference, a consumer society, um, the, the whole set of values for analyzing society in Western Europe is, I find, uh, insufficient. I was very surprised. There is an organization which uh, spends its time analyzing the way in which certain societies are constructed. And Indonesia, and notably the island of Java, turns out to have the highest solidarity quotient of any country in the world. <laughs> and why is that? There must be a religious explanation of that. These people spend a great deal of time and energy feeding their neighbors in all forms. So um, the social science, which I know, doesn't have the answers. Um, and the political philosophy that I know certainly doesn't have the answers. I cannot name one, even though I admire these people's uh, philosophical human and their clarity, uh, I cannot think of one who I could recommend. I'm afraid that uh, the only thing that answers uh, the challenge of secularization is good biblical theology. I see, thank you very much. If there are any other questions. I have a, a desirata, not a question. Please. Uh, at, so, yeah. at some later point, if you could send me a list of the topics that your students are working on for their. Yes. Yeah. That would yes, help me to situate the centers of their interest because some of them will find that I'm way off in left field and studying things that don't concern them, which would be unfortunate. I'd like to know more about what interests them. Yes, of course, I will do this. Thank you. That would be great, actually. <laughs> um, so if there are any, there are no other questions of your father, we will close the session. Thank you very much for your presentation and um, for your contribution regarding the academic event uh, of the Faculty of Theology, uh, part of Ovidius University of Constanza. And also I renew the invitation to participate at the seventh um, edition of International Conference Religion Knowledge Society and the topic of this uh, conference is religion in transition that will take place in May next year. What I have in my mind now is uh, that after the conference, let's have an international seminar um, with 15 or 10 or 15 participants of the conference from the conference. Let's have this international seminar in, the, in Vatra Dorne and with uh, this occasion we will visit uh, the monastery, the famous monasteries uh, of Bukovina uh, mm. and we can you can suggest me a topic for this international seminar something related with spirituality I don't know you can choose this if you agree with that of course mm. have a look at the book I sent you the pdf in the bridal chamber yeah. monks at prayer and see what themes seem to you the most pertinent because that's my most recent publication and um, I Recently, I've been working a great deal on ascetical theology, Isaac the Syrian, St. Macarius, the spiritual homilies, but this may not be exactly what you're looking for. So pick and choose if you like. Yeah, let, me yeah, wish you all, let me wish you all good health and God's blessings in the Christmas feast. Thank you very much, Father. Pray for us and let's have in our heart the Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you very much. I'm very um, grateful for your time and for your, your for your talk. Thank you very much. And also, I want to express the same gra gratitude for uh, my friend, Professor, for my friend, Professor Alexander Yuan Tofan. And with this occasion, I, I want to invite him to have a speech, to have a lecture uh, in the forum of the history and philosophy of religions. And also with the same gratitude, I address to my students, to the PhD students, to master students for their effort to join us in this meeting. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Bye -bye. Are, thank you. If yes. we will meet in person, I'll give you three lectures because I cannot stand <laughs> yes. this being in a small square in a corner of the, yeah. of, of the uh, display and uh, speak to 
yeah. to squares. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. It's all you. Thank you. Thank you.